<clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm John Humphreys. I'm the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Association for Equity and Funding, and I'm so pleased to be joined today by Buzz Brown and Mike Gears from Unetrix, our now long-term corporate partners, and it's great to have you guys with us to talk about modeling uh, the state budget proposals. We have right now uh, a proposal from the Department of Public Instruction. Uh, we have another proposal from the governor and we have AEF's proposal with regard to revenue limits. We're gonna be talking about all those things uh, as well as uh, a heat map that Buzz and Mike were able to put together of revenue limits, which I think will be very interesting for people. And then finally, uh, Buzz and Mike will share some both budget forecasting uh, ideas and models, as well as some of the uh, the ways they can talk about helping you make decisions about spending and uh, most effective use of spending. So I'm going to share my slides here. And uh, in a moment, I'll be uh, inviting Buzz and Mike to share some of their information. But I'm going to kick us off with a little bit of background. Let's see here. There we go. Uh, and we're going to talk about revenue limits and uh, the DPI and Evers proposals, uh, our proposal. And then, as I mentioned, the forecast, uh, budget forecasting, and Mike's got some very interesting reports. EF uh, is a membership organization, and I'm happy to share all of this information with everybody across the straight uh, state of Wisconsin. We actually had a, a new member just join yesterday, Altoona School District in the Chippewa Falls, Eau Claire area, joined AEF yesterday. So I was glad to be getting new members and, and clear that our mission is critical for a lot of, uh, a lot of districts across the state. There is a constitutional uh, section in Wisconsin about uh, school funding, and it says that it, the school funding sh system shall be as nearly uniform as practicable. And I think we, uh, if you don't know already, uh, you will probably agree by the end of this workshop that it is not as uniform as practicable. And this map would probably help convince you of that fact. On the left, you see the entire state uh, with the revenue limits per pupil. All the districts in red are 10,000 and under. That's about 125 school districts. And the districts in blue at 12,000 and more. And the folks that I, I typically share, there's some districts up here that are uh, at 19,000, district over here at 15,000, and district up here over 20,000. That's just fundamentally unfair, and it doesn't reflect uh, our Wisconsin values or the way we anybody, I think, believes that schools should be funded. What you see is a, uh, on the right here is um, a call out of the area suburban, suburban Milwaukee, where McQuanago, Oak Creek, Franklin, and Watertown are at 10,000 per pupil. But then you have districts like Nicolet, Elmbrook, and uh, down here is that uh, one of the smaller um, Raymond or one of the smaller districts, well over 12,000. Um, and so it just creates a non competitive, unfair system. It was supposed to be a five-year proposal, and if you look at the date here, this is the, the School Board Association Journal, 1993. Um, governor signs the budget. That was Tommy Thompson. And he said, I can assure you, we will continue to look at the equity question this fall and come forward with a plan for the next biennial budget. A lot of people were complaining about the lack of equity. And uh, as we know now, uh, that system has been perpetuated. Those differences, I like to say, were baked in, and they've been there for 30 years. So AEF was created in 1992 and uh, to promote financial equity, to pr uh, pursue legal action if equity was not accomplished. And they did, in fact, sue the state, something that AEF is considering once again, if this budget does not make significant improvement in revenue limits. This is what revenue limits looked like 30 years ago. So you had uh, a handful of districts very low at 4,000. You had the bulk of school districts. So what is that, about 30 some districts here at about 5,700 per kid. And then you had a number of districts here at 8,600 and more. And uh, this is just the distribution. I wanna show you now, um, let's see, hopefully you're seeing a different PowerPoint. Is that right, Mike? Could you give me a thumbs up if that's correct? Do you see the revenue limit distributions chart? That looks the same. Oh, okay. All right. So I need to stop the share and go over here. And this is an animation that I created 
of Wisconsin revenue limits over the last 30 years, you get one second with each year. This is the distribution of revenue limits. So you can see how many districts were at different levels. And we're starting to get an accumulation of districts on the left, all sharing the same revenue limit about 10 years ago now. Yeah. So you can see that things uh, have changed to a certain extent, but they have not changed to a great extent as well. And uh, we really feel that the opportunity is in front of us to improve the system. For 30 years, districts that have been stuck at the bottom of the revenue limit system haven't been able to get out of that. We engaged uh, an economist from the University of California to examine revenue limits and the impact on student outcomes. And I'm gonna just share this very briefly. First of all, Dr. Rothstein concluded that revenue limits are persistent over decades. If you had a low revenue limit 30 years ago, you still do almost entirely. Um, they're closely tied to spending. Obviously, if you don't have the money, you can't spend it. And they're also connected to family income, which is interesting and important. There's very little correlation, or even in some cases, a negative correlation between revenue limits and state test scores. And we believe that's because there are so many factors that go into student achievement. Higher revenue limits, though, are strongly correlated with post-secondary enrollment and college enrollment, which is really important. Uh, those are our uh, kids that we want to support with high achievement. I did some analysis uh, with, AE, with the Munetrix uh, data analysis tool, and I compared low revenue and high revenue districts. Students in low revenue districts are much less likely to have the most favorable student to teacher ratios. And we've got some very compelling data that uh, class sizes in low revenue districts are significantly higher than those in high revenue districts. Uh, they, uh, students in low revenue districts are much more, much more likely to have the lowest spending on elementary teachers and much less likely to have the highest spending. And the same is true at the secondary level as well. The, uh, the court decision that I talked about earlier said that if districts can meet the 20 standards, there was no constitutional violation. So again, I'm working with Buzz and Mike, I did some additional analyses to look at three staffing areas that are specifically listed in the 20 standards, guidance and counseling, nursing services, and library media specialists. And we see really significant differences in the ratio of counselors and spending on school counselors. We see significant differences in spending on school nurses and spending on library media specialists. The most favorable staffing ratios exist in districts with significantly higher revenue limits. Uh, and we see it in spending uh, on a per pupil basis. So in those 125 low revenue districts, why should we have to ask why should state tax revenues be unfairly distributed in a way that clearly impacts kids and I think we can all agree every kid should have an equal shot at success based on their work and not historical spending. So getting from the old uh, system from a few years ago where you'll notice there were quite a few districts kind of clustered and a, a large distribution. Um, to this system that we have now, where there are 125 districts at the bottom and then uh, fewer districts with more revenue, took quite a bit of effort. And that was, uh, that was in the budget, two budget cycles ago, <clears throat> four years ago, excuse me. So what we know now is that they ended, uh, this, the state ended the fiscal year a year ago with a, a $4 billion budget balance and a significant rainy day fund. So let's talk a little bit about some of the current proposals. <clears throat> this is DPI's proposal. You'll notice that the bottom, the low revenue amount shifts from 10,000 to 11,000. In other words, everybody shifts over and there's no gap closure. In fact, at the top, those 20 districts get $116 million to educate about 4,000 kids. It's a substantial amount of money. 
here's the Evers budget proposal. He would raise the low revenue sim uh, amount to 11,200, but would also give every district uh, $1,000. So it does close the gaps some, <laughs> excuse me, but not substantially, or I should say, not as substantially as the AEF proposal, where 354 districts would receive the same 11,500 for every student. So what we did was we moved the low revenue amount from the bottom up, I guess, as you're looking at me, the bottom up, 11,500 then becomes the low revenue ceiling, the lowest amount of revenue for any student. And we didn't add any revenue limit to any other district. Our proposal then is that all districts should get an inflationary CPI kind of an increase using per pupil categorical aid instead of using revenue limits that are distributed equally. Instead, it's time to start closing revenue limit gaps. So if you compare those different proposals, Again, 125 districts at the minimum in the current uh, distribution. When you look at that, that's $10,000. So districts funded within 10% of the minimum are all those districts funded at 11,000 and below. That's about 75% of districts and DPI's proposal doesn't change that at all. The governor's proposal increases the number of districts at the minimum by about 50%. It goes to 187 districts but it only raises the number of districts funded within 10% of the minimum by about 4%, where the AEF proposal really makes a significant dent in those gaps and differences. 350 districts would be at 11.5, and uh, that means only about, what is it? There's 422 districts, so <clears throat> it'd still be about 70 districts that are funded a little higher. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, districts funded within 10% of that 11.5 would be 93% of districts. We think that's a much more fair kind of a distribution of funds. My comments with legislators has been have been that uh, if the district could have, the legislature could afford to do 700 per pupil in the budget four years ago. In other words, they went from 9,300 to 9,700 to 10,000. We think they can do 1,500 now. And if not, perhaps they would allow taxpayers to raise their own rates. In other words, do 700 like they did before and put it to the taxpayers rather than having an unequal cap and allowable revenues. Uh, we think this would create a lot more equity. So here's the heat map. Uh, and this is Buzz's work. This is really fascinating to me. When you look at the districts in red, those are districts at the left side of the, the values of, uh, of the revenue limit. We have 125 districts at 10,000 or below. And you can see that I put that slider up to 12,000. So you get a, a, a very uh, clear idea of the number of districts that are getting greater than 10,000. And if it's above 12,000, those districts don't have any color at all. Um, so you can see there's quite a bit of variability in that heat map. So let's look what happens with Governor Evers proposal. So the, the dollar amount shifted now, the, uh, the districts over 13.2 are have no color at all, they're transparent or white. And uh, you can see that the low revenue ceiling is 11.2. But what I want you to notice is that there's still a good deal of variability and inconsistency in uh, district revenue limits. And here's the AEF proposal, 354 districts at or below 11.5. And you can see there's a lot more consistency. I think AEF members would argue that there is no good reason why one district should get thousands of dollars more per pupil than one of our members. It makes no sense at all. We'd love to see a map that has one color where everybody gets a same base per pupil and there is uh, uh, funding based on student need, uh, but there would be a consistent base. You can work on your own uh, revenue limit uh, scenarios using Buzz's uh, and Mike's heat map. Uh, I put the link here. I'll be sending these slides out. Actually, I'll be uploading them to our uh, to the file, the Google Drive that has the uh, slides for this uh, session. 
and the session will be recorded and available on YouTube. So you can get your, uh, you can look at your CISA, you can look at your district and play with those different, um, different scenarios. I think it's really quite interesting and you can just pick out a CISA and uh, adjust the selected values. A lot of fun to check that out. So, so that's what I've got. Um, we are working hard on legislative advocacy now. Uh, I went to 85 key legislative offices two weeks ago at the Capitol. And all of those documents uh, that I shared with legislators are on the AEF website. You can grab those there. Um, they looked like this. Uh, this is Representative Allen, and I'm using that same suburban Milwaukee area, calling out McQuanago, Oconomowoc, and Waukesha and saying, look at their, their relatively low revenue districts. Why should they get, you know, a thousand dollars less than one of the his other constituent districts, Kettle Moraine, uh, it's simply not fair that those districts would get low, uh, lower amounts per pupil. Here's Senator Quinn. It looks a little different because he's got a lot more districts, but I called out the districts that are AEF's members and uh, asked the question, why should Mercer, South Shore, and Lakeland Union High School get 50, 80% more funding per pupil? So I really encourage folks to go in. There's another YouTube video explains each of these areas in the legislative handouts. But I did one of these for just about every uh, key legislator. And I'd encourage you to check those out. There's a lot of work. But uh, it does make the system uh, very clear. And the data are all local for each legislator. So our, our end game is uh, that joint finance will do what they did four years ago lift school funding up from the bottom first uh, on an equal, uh, and that any additional school funding would be on an equal per pupil basis, uh, per pupil categorical uh, allocation. We're also advocating around improved special education funding and have additional maps on that. You can download those maps on our website. Uh, and frankly, we hope to be irrelevant in about, uh, what is that, four months? Um, and we hope that uh, the revenue limit system is made significantly more equitable and that there's additional special education funding, making our uh, concerns and the issues around inequity uh, irrelevant. And so I'll be out of a job. If anybody's looking for somebody, I, I'd be happy to help. So. You've got my contact information there, and I'm going to uh, stop sharing my slides and invite uh, Buzz and Mike to share theirs. I think, I, there we go. I've changed that over. Now, I am happy to, uh, before we do that, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody wants to know anything else about the revenue limit system and kind of what AEF is proposing. Uh, feel free to unmute or and you can either go on screen if you want, or if you'd prefer to just ask a question in the audio, that would be fine too. I just want to say thank you, John, um, for putting together all this information. I did end up sending out um, uh, informational packets to each one of our legislatures, and I also have our superintendent meeting with them on Monday morning. So hopefully it's helpful. So thank yeah. you again. Oh, you're very welcome. It it uh, it's great to to have those conversations with people, and and it's such an easy story to tell. You know, people are just drawn in by it, and so I'm glad to hear the resources are useful, and I was happy to happy to put those together. All right, well, Buzz, I think you uh, are able to share your slides, or Mike, whoever's going to run from the Munatric side, and I'm going to mute myself and uh, go off screen. And uh, thank you again for joining us. It'll be fun to fun to share more about your uh, prediction. You want, to, you want me to go ahead there, Mike? Yes. All right, let me share my screen. Uh, so you can see my screen okay? Yep. All right. Um, well, thanks, John, for the opportunity to uh, be with you today. Uh, what I thought I would do is to uh, go in live into our database and do some actual uh, what ifs here. And I, I did a, a quick little spreadsheet where I, I took, uh, you know, four districts here. I, I took their 2022 enrollment, what their current uh, state max level is. Um, I looked at the fund balance percent, and then um, notice here I'm looking at 2021 general fund revenues. 
we batch load the entire state. So um, we have every school district and charter school uh, in the state of Wisconsin loaded with detailed financial data, but the 2022 data hasn't been published publicly yet. So I, the best I could work with is 2021. So I'm going to baseline off of 2021 data. And what I wanted to calculate here was the, the net effect of the three proposals. And uh, so this then uh, gave me um, what would be the boost in revenue for each of those four school districts in the four proposals. And then I just added that to the general fund revenues and came up with a, a target. And the reason I'm doing it that way is we have a little tool, we call it the forecast builder. So uh, let me go back to, um, you can see I could search for any school district in the, uh, in the state here. So let's go to Denmark. And uh, one of the first things I look at when I'm studying a district is I like to go down into the financial reports and look at the size of the fund balance. I could see at one time it was as high as about almost 23%. It's currently at 17%. Um, it's kind of a normal uh, fund balance, I think, for a school district. And uh, again, I have the um, 2021 data loaded, but not uh, 22. What we wanna do in, in this tool that we call the forecast builder, some, uh, sometimes it's referred to as the North Star approach. You, you cast out in the future, one year, two, three, four, five, however many, however many years you wanna cast out. And you put an anchor point out there of a fund balance percent. You estimate your revenues and then it will goal seek backwards and tell you how much you can, ex, you can ex, uh, spend each year. Um, the for affordable services model. It's telling you how much you can afford to spend. And so uh, just to show you how it works, uh, I'm uh, working with Denmark schools here. I'm going to drill down on 2021 because that's the year of uh, the most data that I have. And you could see when I look at the financial report, here's the, uh, the revenues and expenditures by fund, and there's the fund balance. Uh, down at the bottom are these tools. Uh, the public does not see these. Uh, public has access to much of this data. It's publicly available. But um, many things are only available to users of the system. So that's what you're seeing down here. And um, I want to go into, uh, let's see, Denmark return 2021. Why am I? Oh, interesting. Let me. Let me go to uh, Nielsville a second. Did I? There's Nielsville. Let me drill down on 2021. Um, here we go. Forecast builder. Uh, so I'm switching to Nielsville. Uh, Nielsville has a 75% fund balance. And in the DPI proposal, it's um, their revenues would go from 11 million seven, let's say to 12, six. And so I'm gonna run the forecast builder. I wanna go out uh, just one year. As I said, you could actually, uh, if you wanted to, you could you know, put this out uh, three, four, five years to, if you wanted to do some top level um, analysis. I'm just gonna go out one year from 21 to 22. Scenario A, just an arbitrary scenario. Now, remember, uh, Nielsville has a 75% fund balance, so that's pretty healthy. And it, it, as I understand, they might be uh, pulling some funds to do some uh, building improvements or something, but let's just say for experiment, I wanna spend down uh, my fund balance and uh, we're actually gonna increase revenues. So we're going to increase revenues at the same time we're gonna spend down the fund balance. So let's process that. Um, and uh, let's go back to our screen here and see what we get. Uh, we've created a, another record here. There's my scenario A. And uh, we have a new report that shows up. Let's take a look at this. Remember, uh, previously I pulled up this report that shows uh, fund balance. I now have scenarios, so I could look at the two. So here's uh, what you see in green is the actual audited data. It's, there's the 75% fund balance. 
my target was over here. I said, let's, let's spend some of that down. Let's go to a 65% fund balance. And um, we put in a revenue, what we thought was going to happen for the, the next year. There's my 12.6 in revenues. This is what we call, again, the affordable services model. It's telling me I could spend 12.4 million in, in the next year if I uh, assume I'm going to spend down some of my fund balance and I get this additional money from the DPI proposal. Now, if I drill down on that scenario that I just did, uh, there's no detail behind it. it. It just calculated a total number for me. So let's run another little tool here. We call it the budget builder. Um, this is my baseline. This is what it's going to start with. So that's that affordable service that it calculated. I could tweak it a little bit if I want, but I'm just gonna leave it as is. Let's go ahead and process that. Um, and now it's built a budget for me. And if I look at the financial report, there's, um, there's my new uh, revenue number, the expenditures associated with that. And what it did is it looked backwards and it said, what do you normally spend um, uh, instruction basic as a percent of total expenditures and school administration and transportation, and whatever. Now you can tweak these after the fact and adjust them if you want to adjust um, how you want to spend that money. And as you can see here, um, you could do this multiple times. You could create multiple scenarios. Um, here's one I had done earlier. This is scenario B. I called it, that's the 12.8 million. So that's the uh, governor's proposal. I could run this one more time and let's go ahead and do it. We'll do the AEF model. I'll drill, drill down on 21 again. Uh, come down and hit the uh, forecast builder. I only wanna go out one year. Uh, we'll make this scenario C. Um, let's do 70%. We'll, we'll spend down a little bit of the fund balance and let's just say 13, 13, one and hit process. Let's, uh, let's go back to the home page. Let's look at uh, in the financial reports. I wanna go to my size of fund balance scenario. You can see here's my, my various scenarios that we've created, the 70%, the 65%. And again, if I drill down on my scenario C, there's no detail behind that. So let's hit the uh, budget builder, process that. And uh, while I'm still here on C, let's run another report here called multi-year comparison. So here's my AEF. There's the governors, there's the DPI, there's last year's audited numbers, 2020s. We could adjust this and get two years, three years, four years, five years, whatever, but allows you to see your various um, scenarios. Um, and again, this, as I said, we call this the North Star approach. It's intended to be a very top-down, very quick. It doesn't replace the detailed budgeting that you need to do for your upcoming year. But whenever you're trying to do some what-if scenarios, it's just a great way to be able to um, sort of plan out to give you some number to begin with. And then you can uh, start to talk to your departmental heads about uh, what number they have to work towards. Um, but that's Plus, using the forecast builder and the budget builder. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just very cool to see that. Would you go back to the uh, the, the columns with the different scenarios? He was just there. The um, the report itself? Yeah. This one? Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you look at total revenues and you look at uh, the differences, actually, I was going to oh. say scenario. Uh, I'm sorry, not that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one. That's right. And you just look at those numbers that the total revenues, A, B, and C, if you think about that, say, five hundred, four hundred thousand dollars difference between those, isn't I, I just find that very instructive that that's four to five hundred thousand dollars that's staying in Nielsville and is not going to other districts to support, you know, twenty thousand dollars per kid in in our scenario. It's just it's it's just interesting to see the redistribution of funds to support districts that have been getting thousands of dollars more every year for years and years and years. So for what it's worth, I, I appreciate seeing the numbers. Yeah, uh, thanks, John. 
Um, one other thing I might mention, if you are doing top-down um, planning like that, we have this, uh, we call it the download scenario builder. Um, I'm, let's see, I'm on Nielsville 2022. Let's go ahead and download that. Um, let's save it and let's go back and see what we got from hitting that button. And let's see, which one did I just download? Uh, this one right here. Uh, what this did is uh, it downloaded all of the uh, information that we have for Nielsville um, in, the, in the tool. And we've actually used this in public settings with school boards, um, teachers union in place, citizens in place. We've done this with municipalities as well. Um, this allows you to just brainstorm and things like, um, you know, all right, let, you know, let's say we think because of DPI, we're gonna get an extra uh, million. And then it, you could see it's starting to adjust the numbers. And, you know, maybe we're going to do some building improvements or something. And it, it's, uh, um, and it's starting to build out these scenarios. And then the idea is they can then upload that back into the tool. And it's, it's just a way to, to give a tool to brainstorm uh, increases in revenues, or it could be decreases. You know, maybe uh, the prior year had a lot of Vessers money in there, and you think you're going to, um, that's not going to carry into the next year. Maybe the HVAC system, you know, we're going to do this over, um, spread it out over multiple years. Um, but you come up with these various, I think we should do this, I think we should do that. And you have scenarios again, uh, good, better, best, or, you know, more capital improvements than others. And then we load it back into the tool. Uh, it's just a, another way to, to do that uh, high level top down budgeting. And then I'll go back to the home screen here. But very quickly, that just wanted to show how that tool works. It's really handy when you have like a significant bump in revenues or some anomaly in revenues or expenditures that's coming up in the upcoming year. Mike, was there anything you wanted to um, uh, focus on for that? Uh, not for that, but um, John showed the um, the screenshots of the of the tool of the heat map. Mm -hmm. um, do you mind maybe just modeling that real quick? Um, it's one thing to see a picture, but how easy it is to model. Yeah, um, I think I could probably find that quickly here. Actually, I've got it. I've got oh, it up. Do on you my, have it up? Yeah, I can do that. Oh, yeah, why don't you go ahead? Let's see here. Buzz's the screen is still there. There we go. Yeah, that'll show how we put a toggle in there so you could toggle for the three proposals. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so and and maybe just to follow on our uh, our uh, discussion of specific districts, maybe I'll just pick on uh, CESA seven which is where Denmark is. Whoops, that's not yeah. seven. It's four. I, I came up with four. I don't know how that happened. Let's see, there and that. There we go. So this is the, uh, this is the base right now. And what, what I did previously was to move the sliders to be about two thousand dollars more than the uh than the um minimum okay and let me just zoom out here a little bit so you can see there's some equity inequity there but if we take this and put it down to about twelve thousand then it really shows how much diversity of revenue limits there is in our current model. Then if I jump up to the uh, the governor's proposal, and because he adds 1200 to everybody, I'm going to add another 1200 and go from 12 to 13.2 as the top there. And now you'll see again, the amount of diversity in revenue limits for each of the districts. And finally, the AEF proposal, 
11, 5. So I'm going to move the top up to 13, 5 and hopefully see. Give it a second. I believe that we have, and, and it may not, it may not relate as well to CISA 7. They may already have quite a bit of uh, um, parity. But you can see, let's see, is this, is this, uh, that's, now that is Reedsville. Um, and I can then call out Denmark. Let's see. So there's Denmark. And so, like everybody else, they, they become a, they, they're at 11.5. Interestingly, you know, here we've got Sevastopol over 12. Again, there's Reedville, 12, 11. What is this one over here? Uh, Stockbridge. And there's Sheboygan. So they can go in and play with uh, their CISA and check out how the, um, how the different scenarios impact parity and equity within their district or within their CISA, I would just say that as you go between the different scenarios, adjust the top level to be about $2,000 more than the low revenue ceiling. And that'll give you a good idea of how this shake out. This selected value uh, adjusts with each of the scenarios. So you've got to, you got to modify that to see the differences. Does that help Mike? Yeah, no, I just, I think it's real important to see how easy it is to play with this tool. Yeah, it's, it's pretty neat perspectives yeah good um, well you were going to share some uh some use of funds information yeah so there's always two parts to this or maybe three parts uh, obviously the revenues but the other part is the expenditures what do we do with the money once we get it and then the good news is for wisconsin wisconsinites and i grew up in burlington is that um everyone's going to get some amount of money just how much and how it's going to be dispersed. So I'm going to share my screen. So the other half of what we do at Munetrics is to really look at <clears throat> how we're spending money and how it affects student outcomes. So again, as you saw it with buzzes, this is the school district of Denmark. And I'm this is all publicly available information. But if I go into financials <clears throat> and I can look at how my district compares. Again, what this gives me is representation of CISA 7, with Denmark being here. This is total expenditures, general fund only, and expenditures per student. And you can see the expenditures uh, per student varies quite a bit with the average right around uh, probably somewhere around 13. So you can see some outliers here. And this gives you a, a kind of a good idea. So you got the heat map, but this is specific data points on expenditures. Um, revenues, um, let's see. Revenues and expenditures per student. This gives us another, the blue line is the regional average for CISA 7. And then this is Denmark's revenues per student and expenditures per student. So you get to see a little more detail and how you stack up. And then one of my favorites is this financial explorer. So again, with all this data 2021, um, I can select just like the other uh, Tableau chart, I can add different counties here and get all of those school districts. So I've just added three more, two more to CESA 7. But I know that Green Bay is kind of an outlier. So I can go in here, turn off Green Bay. Well, Mike, they're, start... they're an outlier in total, but if you look at expenditures per pupil, they're you know, they're right in the mix. They're a low revenue yep. district. It's kind of interesting. And I would just comment, Gibraltar is, I think, the highest revenue limit of any regular school district in the state. So look at their spending per pupil. It's very, very high. And then, but you can also look at percent and get a better or different perspective. And then once I'm in expenses, 
Buzz likes to talk about uh, the three tiers, fun function and object code. So function, if, let's just take instructional basic programs and just start to look at that. And then underneath that, you've got regular curriculum. If I want to add instructional staff to this, it's that easy to look at different pieces. And again, on a percentage basis, um, I can see Sheboygan is 13% of their um, expenditures on an undifferentiated curriculum. Gibraltar's 13%. So it's pretty even, but here, regular curriculum, 21% in Kohler. And so again, I get more ways to uh, look and slice and dice the, rev uh, the expenditures. I could do the same thing and go to revenues here. Um, what's our time frame, John? It's uh, about 17 minutes to the top of the hour. Yeah, that, that would be fine, Mike. Um... If okay. you, you know, whatever works for you and people will, yeah, you know, they'll chime out if they need to. So this is expenditures per achievement. And again, this is kind of a return on investment type of scenario. And this is what we like to do or talk about is um, what is the return on investment? How, where are you spending your money? And what is What is the return? So uh, the red triangle is always gonna be Denmark in these scenarios, uh, but you can see the size of the dot is free and reduced lunch. So Sheboygan area school district with free and reduced lunch at 63%, their fifth grade state math scores for 2021 are below this average of 50% for CESA five. I can quickly go up and look at third grade ELA. Now the expenditures per student are pretty much gonna stay the same because we're it's still the same amount, but you see the shift in achievement. What's interesting is when you're looking at this like instructional expenditures per student, um, let's say this outlier uh, Algoma. So we're right around 63, 6,500 here. We're up here, we're up close to nine, 10,000. So you've got a, a three to $4,000 gap just in the structural expenditures per student. So this hel helps illustrate, I think, the inequity that exists based on the revenue limits and what we get to spend. Um, personnel, uh, again, what's, what's the longevity? So, it's not only important to look at what you're spending for teachers, but where is that money being uh, spread out across the district? And here, if we look at, uh, this is 2020, if we look at 2021, we see some of the shifts in longevity, which means a shift in expenses. So some of these things are really good to have, but more importantly for a school district like Denmark, we have the ability with peer groups, our functional of, of peer groups, to customize and select school districts that I want to compare myself to, to make it more of an apples to apples. So with NCSA 7, I've selected these additional four school districts, close to enrollment, fund balance, fairly close, um, foundation allowance, et cetera. But I can still get the same types of reports but now it's a, a report that's showing like size districts or communities. And if I go to my academic achievement, again, this is the same type of report as we saw before. And so Denmark is in terms of fifth grade math, according to these peers with similar sizes and similar uh, economic metrics. Now we can start seeing, maybe we ask ourselves, what is Wrightstown doing where their fifth grade math is over almost 65%. Uh, if I'm two rivers, 
I want to know what Kiel, Wrightstown, and Denmark are doing. Again, not to uh, call out districts who aren't doing as well, but there's got to be some best, better, better best practices here in these school districts. And in CESA 7, I'd want to know what they're doing for fifth grade math, if that makes sense. And again, we still have the same tools with our fin financial data explorer, et cetera. Um, one more staff reports. Now, when we look at staff longevity in the peer group, we get a little different perspective. We get all five districts. So we're let's go back to the latest year data, but we can look at all, all five districts almost head to head. So we can see Sheboygan has a, their highest, uh, over 25% of their, their teaching staff is in the six to 10 years. Denmark, the majority, almost 25% is in the higher category. And then when you look at two rivers, maybe there's some reasons why some of their achievement isn't matching up with the longevity. So again, it's not specific pieces, but this is to help make the invisible visible, help give you some ideas of where we can maybe ask questions of how we're doing and what we're doing. So I'm gonna do one more thing. So we can get into specific individual student assessment data. So we have a tool down here called it academic achievement. We have the student growth explorer. And if you're using NWEA or Dibble, Star, iReady, FastBridge, we have dashboards for them. And if I go to NWEA, I have a, about 12 different, 15 different reports that I can start drilling into. So if I want to look at student goals, let's say I just want to look at um, the latest winter scores. I can do that. Uh, what goal areas, let's say I just want to look at numbers and operations and measurement. And then I could take and just look at my low and low average students. And that quickly, I've got pretty much my MTSS uh, groupings by teacher. Again, this is a sample data, so I'm not worried about uh, any private data being, sh being shared uh, illegally or anything. But now I've got an idea of who these kids are and who we should be targeting that quickly from one location here in Munetrix. Now, the other thing, so we, I mean, we can go at the district level, the building level, the teacher level, cohorts, and we've got a place for uh, ACT, so, um, or in PSAT and ACT. Um, if I go back to my student growth explorer, in my academic achievement. Um, one of the things John and I talked about this week in preparing is there is legislation for reg or reading readiness and increasing the accountability for reading readiness. So in our tool, because it's mandatory for reporting in the state of Michigan, we developed this tool called IRIPS. And IRIPS are individual reading improvement plans. And so what we do is we take advantage of having your roster embedded into Minetrix along with your assessment data, any SEL data. And this fills in this reading, uh, individual reading improvement report. And we got the student demographics. So these fake students, their address would all be filled in here, who they are, what their ethnicity is, any assessment data that we have in our system on them, 
would be loaded here. And then we start going down the list, other factors that may affect performance. So maybe this student has a vision or hearing issue. <clears throat> we talk about differentiated classroom instruction. We could do it here. What additional supports? Um, maybe we're talking um, reading recovery. Then the progress monitoring plan. Again, this is dates here that can be put in, frequency, progress, next instructional focus. And then this is the, the parent connection. What, what can the parent do? There might be some hyperlinks or a document. And then when I'm completed this, I can see the report. And why our customers in Michigan like this is it gives them a standardized way across the school, the district to really see and manage the students that they've de de determined need individual reading plans. So it's all nice and neat and consistent here. And the nice thing is if I do an assessment uh, this spring, I can bring that information in and I can go ahead and hit the edit button and update that report to make it available. And so this, these reports follow the kids. So if you have a report in first grade, the second grade teacher next year would be able to see this report, see what was done, and then be able to do things from there. So that's just a quick overview of some of the uh, academic side of what Munetrix does. We combine finances and academics to really try to look at a return on investment, not only how much money you're getting, uh, how much money you're spending, but where are we getting the best bang for our buck? So I'll stop and see if there's any any questions. Super interesting stuff, Mike and, and Buzz both. I, it, I, I always find those charts interesting when you've got different school district expenditure levels and achievement levels and able to see, like you say, who's got the best return on investment. Um, we do have uh, some folks with us, and I encourage anybody, if you want to uh, unmute and ask any other questions, um, feel free to do that now. Jen, uh, Janelle, we, we picked on Denmark a lot today, this afternoon. I don't know if there's anything in particular uh, uh, ask about or reflect on, but. Um, yeah, I um, I thought it was interesting because I don't often get to see academics, you know, with the financial data. So usually I'm just looking at the financial data. So I thought that was really neat. And also the comparison to the, the peer districts or the other districts. Um, I don't normally get to see that lined up. Thank you. People are usually doing that or going out and searching other district websites, trying to get information and put it together and then somehow compare that. And we just try to make everything easier for uh, everybody. As long as, we, as soon as we get the, the data from DPI, we put it in. Yeah. And your, your individual district data on the assessments, your local assessments and anything like that, we can even do things with surveys and stuff. We put that in as soon as you can get it to us. We import all your data from rosters. Um, we have a integration with NWEA, a data sharing agreement. So you sign that and we automatically get your NWEA data and we're working with uh, NWEA and I ready to initiate that uh, side of things so that the, the handoff of data gets to be automated and not have to go through multiple hands. That's great. Yeah, very interesting. And, and reinforces the idea that more money per pupil doesn't necessarily result in higher student achievement, which, you know, is not particularly uh, supportive of our thesis that money matters. On the other hand, we know that money really does matter. <laughs> so anyway. Well, this gives us a chance if whatever amount we get over the next two to three, four years uh, with the learning loss and stuff, how much of that extra money is really gonna matter? And then who can do the best with the money they're getting yeah. to raise the bar? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, excellent stuff. And then Buzz, thank you for the, the budget forecasting model. I think that's very interesting. And again, looking at those differences in revenues just for Nielsville, Wisconsin, and $400,000 uh, going to Nielsville in our proposal that wouldn't be going there otherwise and instead would be redistributed to other districts that have been getting thousands more per pupil for years. It's just really was very interesting to see that. Thank you. All right. Well, listen, okay. any other, yeah, uh, folks, uh, Munetrix is available online. Uh, you can connect with Mike or Buzz. Uh, I'm certainly happy to send out any other information. This session will be on our YouTube channel uh, probably later today. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Thanks again to Buzz and Mike for the opportunity to work together and all the great data analysis you helped me do. Thanks everybody uh, on behalf of AEF. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, I, said, I just want to say thank you for the partnership yeah. and allowing us to be part of this uh, webinar this afternoon and talk about this stuff. Yeah, you're welcome. Stay tuned for more information about uh, what comes next in the state budget process. We'll be uh, interested to see where that goes. So thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.